Aloha and welcome to Connection to the Cosmos with your host, me, Dr. Lisa Thompson, where I have out of this world conversations with extraordinary people. Today, I'm really excited to have on Constance Victoria Briggs, and we're going to bring her on in just a moment. But first, a couple of announcements. If you haven't had the opportunity yet to grab my free 20 minute meditative journey to meet your galactic family and guides, make sure you do that at mysticmanta.com or drlisajthompson.com. And for those of you that are in the healing field and you want to enhance those abilities or just add on to your modality, um, I'm going to be teaching my Galactic Ascension Channeling Certification Program online February 22nd and 23rd. And then I'm also leading my galactic retreat, which is a five-day immersive retreat, all things galactic, connection to the cosmos, April 30th to May 4th here on the Big Island of Hawaii. So all that information about everything I just shared is at mysticmanta.com or drlisajthompson.com. And then if you are coming to Hawaii, specifically to the Big Island, Kona side, then come see me on one of my big island UFO tours where you will see the night sky in a whole new way using the Generation 3 military night vision goggles. And Big Island UFO Tours has more in, dot com has more information. Okay, bringing forth Constance. Hello, Constance. Hello, Lisa. How are you? And thank you for having me. <laughs> I am so happy to have you here. And so let me read your bio or a little bit of your bio, and um, I, I'm looking forward to our conversation. So Constance Victoria Briggs is an author, researcher, and public speaker specializing in cosmic mysteries, including galactic and moon mysteries, ancient astronauts, extraterrestrials, angels, and the unseen world. She is the author of Earth's Galactic History and its Extraterrestrial Connection, which I have right here and I have had the opportunity to read, as well as The Moon's Galactic History, a look at the moon's extraterrestrial past and its connection to Earth, the Encyclopedia of Moon Mysteries, Secrets, Conspiracy Theories, Anomalies, Extraterrestrials, and more. And then you can read all the rest of the book. She's prolific in writing. <laughs> She has also been featured on shows such as Coast to Coast AM with George Nori, Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, Earth Ancients with Cliff Dunning, Broadcast Team Alpha, Forbidden Knowledge, Spaced Out Radio, and others. Okay, and again, you just have so much going on. So super excited to have the conversation because you're definitely in line with all the things that I love talking about and have geeked out about for years. Mm -hmm. So before we get into your actual like research and the, and the books and all of that, I would love for you to share with me and the audience kind of how you grew up, spiritual, religious, something else, so that we understand how you got on this whole like ET galactic paranormal path. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's such a long story. We don't even have time for me to tell the whole thing. But <laughs> I will say that I have always been since childhood what I will call spiritual, although my mother tried to have me grow up religious. And uh, I understood the difference very early on. So I actually grew up in a in a Baptist household. We weren't very strict or anything like that. We just went to church up until the time I was 12 for uh, one day a week. Then at 12, I decided I had enough of it. I wasn't getting the answers I wanted. I always felt connected, I guess, to the universe. I always had the deep questions in life. Why are we here? Where are we from? I used to think about God all the time. Who and what is God? So... Uh, grew up as an adult, I, uh, I just was on that path to find answers, and I wanted to be a writer. So mm -hmm. along my journey of seeking answers in various, you know, places, um, I studied various religions, I even looked into Wicca to see what they believed, I went on and on and on. And I just started, I amassed all of this information, and I started formulating book ideas. In the meantime, I also learned uh, early on that I, I had what I what we all call our spirit guides. I had someone with me. I could feel them. I would talk to them, and um, I believe that they have helped in my journey. Um, I went from spirituality to um, galactic information because I felt like they were giving me step by step by step information. By the time. I had, you know, gotten past the angels, who they were, spirit guides. 
I had information saying we weren't alone in the universe. And I'm like, what, 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 what are you saying? And, and that there were people coming in from other places. I'm like, what? Okay. So deep dive, 20 years later, I'm writing about ETs and UFOs. Okay. Well, so did you like end up, did you get a degree in writing or like, did you end up going to university or like, what was your original kind of career path too before you I started? Wanted- yeah, I wanted to be an actress. Okay. All right. And writing was my backup. As it turns out, that's probably what I should have been doing the whole time. So no, I didn't get a degree in write in writing or in my research. And let's face it, I tell people there is no degree for what I'm writing about. That, so. that is very true. As a former um, academic, you know, I have a PhD. <laughs> There's no the stuff that we do that you do now and that I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is no degree for that. Well, so, okay. So I guess let's talk about, did you have any kind of ET or UFO experiences that then you were like, oh my God, okay, I really do have to go down this rabbit hole? So when my my first uh, memorable experience, I was 14 and I had no idea what this was. I hadn't taken my journey into angels yet, which was, you know, my, my first deep dive outside of, of uh, the Bible, you know, and, uh, but so uh, when I was 14, I was a bully child. And I took a bunch of, of pills. And during that process of, you know, just lying there, I saw uh, a being, um, I saw a swirling cloud, what looked like a swirling cloud, and it, it dissipated open, and there was someone standing there. And he had on a long robe, and I can remember his face very clearly. And he was asking me to come. He was holding out his hand, asking me to come. And I just looked at him and thought, oh, my God, this is what happens when you take a lot of pills, you know. And he, But what caught my, what most caught my attention outside of the vision itself was his concern. He was mm. very, he looked very worried. And I guess he knew I had had it. I was I was done with life at a very early age. So I, uh, you know, today looking back, I believe that that was um, not even an, an angel, but I believe he was a guide or an ET or ET being. I okay. really. Um, that was one. I also had later in life a bad experience where I had an entity living in my living in my apartment when I was in my 20s, living single. I had to get that entity out and it was causing, you know, problems, paranormal problems. And I learned to call on angels. Okay. When I learned to call on angels, they they were gone. Now, I don't know how far you want me to go with this, Lisa, but um I've heard, you know, my both of my parents have crossed over. I've heard from them. Mm-hmm. After they crossed over, uh, they let me know that they were alive and well on the other side. Um, in my astral travels, I started traveling astrally in my late 20s with conscious, waking up conscious that I was out of my body. Um, I saw a beautiful a ship, a spacecraft, mm-hmm. which taught me that there are crafts in the sky that we cannot see while yeah. we're physical. Some we can. And some we can't, but this thing was like nothing you've ever seen in pictures. Um, when I was nine, I forgot this one. When I was nine, I saw what I believe now was was a UFO or a craft in the sky. And yeah, so I've had some experiences in various areas. Okay, well, you know, because it's when we decide to come out in this very kind of what used to be very fringe very controversial kind of field of ufology and you know back when i was growing up in the 70s 80s 90s you know and forward there was so much stigma around the topic right because people thought we were tinfoil hat wearing crazy people (laughs) and so how what what made you feel comfortable in terms of starting to write about it because when did you write your first book in kind of the galactic realm Oh, wow. Well, the Galactic Realm came in 2019 okay. with, the, with the Moon Mysteries book. Prior to that, I had written uh, an angel book, a book about life after death in the unseen world. Okay. So I came out with that. 
and I wrote about what my thoughts about God in another book, but the galactic stuff was 2019. So I wrote the Encyclopedia of Moon Mysteries um, because I became very interested in what's happening with the moon. Once I understood that the moon is not just a dead thing in the sky, that there was activity up there, I was ready to go down that rabbit hole. And I just learned, I learned a lot and I put my thoughts into an encyclopedia because I thought people would like to look up little articles on the subject of what the astronauts saw, if you believe they went, or, um, you know, what, what all of the light that the light, uh, that the moon has lights and activity going on up there. Maybe you wanted to look up that article. So I thought people would like it and they did, but I learned later that they wanted some to hear my voice. So I wrote the moon's galactic history and it's extra, extraterrestrial connection. And I went a lot, a lot further and a lot deeper and uh, they really liked that. And then people were asking me about the earth, what's happening with all the UFOs, who's visiting us, et cetera. And so I wrote a book on that topic, the earth's galactic history. So this started with the galactic in 2019. Up to okay. Today. Okay. Well, and I, that's kind of around the same time. I mean, um, I met my part, you know, part of my groups are the Arcturians. And so I met them in um, 2018. And then, yeah. And then I moved here to Hawaii in 2020 and then was seeing all this stuff. I've been, but I've seen stuff my whole life like you. So, okay. So I know we, we want to talk about the Earth's galactic history, but I know there are some curious people out there that are like, okay, what do you mean there's there are people on the moon? So do you want to... Uh go into that just yeah like you know we we have a very similar understanding about what's going on but so yeah share share what you've learned you know i mean basically uh, this goes we i could go all the way back let's go back to the uh invention of the telescope okay. when the telescope was invented the astronomers immediately started seeing movement on the moon they saw lights on the moon, which today we would call UFOs. They didn't know anything about UFOs. So they said, oh, I saw stars. I saw lights. They were this color, that color, this shape. They were near the craters, uh, you know. And, you know, today, of course, we know that somebody's up there, you know, doing this. I mean, there's not supposed to be movement on the moon, correct, from what they've told yeah. us. Right. It's supposed to be a dead rock with no life happening. Well, it's jumping up there. We've got we've got um, astronomers today saying, look, I've seen lights around, sitting around the craters. It looks like a parking lot up there. All right. I've seen pictures with um, UFOs coming out of coming out of crevices on the moon uh, and look what looks like fleets of UFOs. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got, you know, some military people who have talked about seeing things up there and seeing motherships we we've got the astronauts i know some don't believe it but you know i believe we went they, yeah. they've given testimony to things they saw and we have pictures from those missions of things up there you know there's this one picture with what looked like blue lights surrounding the astronauts while they were working on the moon from one of the missions i think it was apollo 17 looked like blue lights or blue probes um we have one from a uh, picture from the apollo 15 mission which looks like a large uh, cigar shaped craft sitting on the moon thought to have maybe been an ancient ship by officials who wanted to send a mission up to look at that thing. So we have all kinds of evidence. Mm -hmm. we, we've heard that evidence has been covered up, but whatever wasn't covered up, we still have enough to let us know that there is something going on up there and it looks like somebody really is on the moon. Okay, so I haven't read that particular book that you wrote, but I do like a, the theory that the moon is hollow and that it's metal like because it rings like a bell um, and that it's not even like it's artificial, that it was brought in kind of as a spaceship, kind of like the Death Star in a right. way. <laughs> Star Wars. Right, right. Yeah, so what it, what is your understanding about all of that? So, you know, my one of my favorite books is titled Our Mysterious Spaceship Moon. And this thing grabbed my attention when I when I first came across it. So basically, um, there are 
there are writings from our ancient past by authors that alluded to, or in some of them straight out said, there was a time that there was no moon in our sky, that Venus was the uh, light that shined brightest during the night. And it even named um, a group of people who lived during that time and uh, called the Arcadians. And it says these people uh, ran wild in the earth. So it was um, a time before man was cultured all right, and it was several uh, um, well-named philosophers and writers from our past that talked about it. Not only that, there is a monolith on Earth on uh, in Bolivia that's ancient that has symbols and writings uh, that talk about a time when there uh, the Earth came in. I mean, excuse me, the moon came into the Earth's uh, vicinity and caused storms, you know. And I always say to people, I don't believe that the ancients were playing hoaxes and just scribbling things on monoliths, you know. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we've got that. And then two um, Russian scientists came forward in the early 70s and said from everything they could look at from the Apollo astronauts, it looked to them that this moon, this uh this thing, <laughs> it's um, a spaceship. And they put their reputations on the line. And, you know, they were from Russia. So I, I'm always saying, I don't know if they should have done that if they weren't really serious, right? So right. basically what they said was they think it was a gener it's a generational ship where there are beings inside of it that prepared for a long journey across the universe and placed themselves for whatever reason in Earth's vicinity, they looked at some of the science uh, that the Apollo astronauts brought back with them. You know, some of the uh, the, the the rocks and the and the dirt and the and the data, such as the moon. You know, being if you hit it with a, a meteorite, the craters are all kind of the same size, uh, no matter si same depth rather, no matter what size uh, meteorite hit it. It never went any deeper. They believe that the hull of the moon is made of uh, very hard materials protecting something. The question is, what is inside that this the moon is protecting? The idea is that there's somebody in the moon. And, of course, we know that there have been structures found on top of the moon. Yeah. So somebody's using the top and the inside. And that's a well-known thing. You know, that came out in the 70s that uh, structure and those were found by the lunar orbiters that went up, so. Yeah, well, one of the things that, um, when I was 15, I got to have an experience where I was taken on a craft and I was taken to inside of Io, one of Jupiter's moons. And what I know now, and I do fully like believe this, is that there, a lot of our uh, solar system, the planetary bodies, there's life inside, right? And, right? And because it's number one, a more stable environment. Right, right. And and life can exist in so many different forms. It's not just, you know, I, I'm a biologist by training. That's my doctorate. <laughs> and what mainstream scientists deem life and what they're looking for out there is just such a tiny little speck of what actually exists. Right. I agree. I agree. And, you know, it, it is said that we are living inside out on the earth, um, so to speak, and that being on the surface is not a very good or smart way to do it because we are vulnerable to catastrophes, you know, um, and, it, you know, you know, it said that we've been wiped out. Humanity has had to start over several times right. where there is uh, a civilization and, and perhaps more than one type of group inside the earth that have been living there since the beginning. Some were ETs that came in and some may have been uh, evolving alongside of us, humans that evolved down there while we were up here, yeah. living inside and have been protected. All right. Yeah. Now we're because of, you know, we're not protected from the radiation, anything that may hit the earth, the storms, we're constantly being wiped out. And I really don't understand why someone now in our modern age doesn't get the idea <laughs> that, that this might work really well, you know, in, 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 in protecting humanity. Not only that, so we've got the moon, we've got um, Earth. It's looking like uh, Mars is Phobos, maybe. Uh, there may be someone in there as well. 
And, um, you know, I always, I talk about Star Trek a lot in my writing. And um, there was, uh, there's a story that uh, Gene Roddenberry wrote about um, before the Apollo astronauts went up. And he, uh, in one of his shows, Star Trek, there was an asteroid traveling across the universe that was a generational ship that had a group of people in it. Okay, according to Gene, right? You know that I don't know where he got. Well, that's another story. I think he got the idea from channeling sessions that he was sitting in on from extraterrestrials. But anyway, so this asteroid um, had this group of people in it that had been there for generations, and it was designed to look like an asteroid, even though it was a spaceship. So my point in telling that story is, how many other um, planetary bodies are out there that we are not aware of beings living on the inside. All right. Now I know that I just talked about science fiction, but to me, it looks like the same deal with the moon, people yeah. living inside earth, people living inside Phobos and IO. All right. Yeah. It's a thing out there. Well, and Venus, we have our next door neighbor. Venus. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Venus. Yeah. They're humans living inside Venus. <laughs> Or Venusians <laughs> as well. And there's so, been a number of them that came here and said, you know, from Venus. And nobody yep. believes but I, no, well, I do. I do. So, I do. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, so let's shift to the Earth's galactic history. So what um, you know, so again, when I was reading it, I'm like, okay, yep, yep, yep. I <laughs> you're writing about everything that I have really understood. So what what do you think is really important for people to know right. about our history? Right. Okay. So I just wanted to say the reason that I wrote this book, besides people asking me what's what's going on out there, is because, you know, Lisa, in our daily lives, we come across people all the time who have no idea that we're yeah. not alone in the universe. And uh, this is something I think is important. All right. So I wanted to write a book that would kind of give people an introduction. All right. To to what's happening. So I kind of touched on a lot of areas. I touched on the theories of our human origins being connected to extraterrestrials. Not a popular subject, but something that I think people should be aware of. And if you know, at least hear the arguments. At yeah. least hear the theories, at least hear the channelings are, are what we in the science, you know, behind some uh, aspects of our origins. Um, so I talked about, uh, wait, did you have a question? I'm sorry. It was. Well, I just wanted you to share what you thought was important for people to know. Yeah, okay. You're doing perfect because <laughs> okay, you're, all right. you're telling why you wrote the book, too. Because Right. Right. So we write books for reasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted people, you know, one important thing too is I wanted people to know that we have a past with extraterrestrials. Um, I often hear that, oh, the, the UFO flap or excitement started in the 40s. Yes, more UFOs came in um, around that time. Uh, but we have a history going back to ancient times with extraterrestrials and we have evidence. All right. So, you know, from everything from writings to to art, art on the wall from the ancients, messages um, of who and how they lived, who they lived with and how they interacted with extraterrestrials. I covered that in, um, you know, in my book. So I, I thought that was important that they know that it didn't just start today. Yeah. You know, for people who are afraid, talk about an invasion. No, no, no. If they wanted right. to do that, they could have done that millions of years ago. All yeah. right. So that's just my my thought on that. Um, I wanted people to know that there's something going on with our Earth's or Earth's oceans. Um, this is my probably my favorite area. The fact that there is someone in our in our waters, and I believe it's a number of groups from extraterrestrials to um, perhaps a group that has been down there since humanity began here as well. But I do believe that um, extraterrestrials are, are in the oceans, and I give uh, areas that you you know people can Google and look up and see you know where they've been low you know bases under the waters might be located, and some of the stories that people have seen yeah. uh, of of what they've seen in the waters, and also humanoid beings that have been seen. It's very interesting stuff. But also, I think it's important 
for people to know. And I think it's important because I think that we are on the brink of something big, that there will be an introduction by the extraterrestrials in the next, I think, the next few years. And I don't think that we should be in the dark. You know, I think that if we don't educate people, there's going to be a, a, some problems, right? right. And yeah. I don't think that the ETs themselves, uh, at least they have indicated that they don't feel comfortable just kind of barging in. So they're trying to slowly educate the masses. But, you know, people say, oh, you know, uh, the government is keeping this, this, and this from us. And yes, they are. But I also think that the extraterrestrials have a hand in the timeline. Mm -hmm. of we as a world society will be introduced to them. So yes. that's another reason. Um, in the book, I talk about like the hollow earth. I believe there are beings there. Signs, signals, messages, and clues. Now, there are different groups of extraterrestrials out there. Now, one way, how do we know this? Well, people have seen them, channeled them, etc. But one basic way is just look at all the different shapes of UFOs, shapes, sizes, different ways of move, maneuvering, all of this. I believe there are different groups uh, coming in. Yeah. And some, so some can talk to us directly, telepathically. Some are using other methods such as the crop circles, but there have also been radio signals uh, picked up in the past, which the general public has no knowledge of. Um, so I put those, some of those in my book so people are aware. Um, I talked a lot about the UFOs, um, how I think that they are operating, how scientists have think they're operating, I should say, um, and the different ones and the, the different groups of beings that go with each ship, we think. Um, I talk about stargates and wormholes um, and uh, portals being used by ETs. I think this is important because we keep hearing um, from the general, from the mainstream, that ETs can't be visiting us because they can't travel the long distance across right. the universe. Well, obviously, obviously, Lisa, if you're dealing with beings that are hundreds, thousands, and sometimes millions or even billions of years ahead, they've figured things out. They yep. have that back, right? Yeah, they do. <laughs> yep. Well, so, okay. So a few things that I just want to... Um, you know, just give examples of validating your research. So here in Hawaii, we do have a suspected underwater ET base off the southern part of our state. And we have so much transmedium activity, you know, for the people who are like, what's transmedium? The craft coming in and out of the water. We have so much of that around our island, around the, all the islands, but our island. I've met so many people that have experienced that phenomena. And, um, and then I've also witnessed what I, I would say are portals in the sky because, you know, I do these night sky watch UFO tours and we're using generation three military night vision goggles. So we're seeing all the moving things up there, you know, whatever category they are, but we see a lot of craft. And there's some nights where we will watch and there are craft leaving out of the exact same spot in the sky where satellites would have to keep going like that you would they would still be visible but these craft are like basically leaving or appearing out of the same place in the sky like time after time after time so yeah it, i love that i'm gonna come visit you lisa please do <laughs> well and then i have i'm gonna sit with you out there well and you know and part of what we're teaching very similar stuff. So on my tour, I do share our very ancient history and I have my own, you know, I channel different ET races, but I also have remembered different lives at, you know, as ET being part of this earth and those experiences. I just went to Egypt in April for two and a half weeks and saw the evidence, the pictures <laughs> on the walls, right? And nice. I spent two weeks in Peru last year. I mean, like, for me, it's absolutely undeniable. And so that's why I really wanted you to be on my show because you have done so much research. You know, your your book is very comprehensive. And like you said, it's a good intro for people that are curious or starting to go down some of these rabbit holes. 
And Thank like you, you said, yeah, it's, um, I think all of us, even if we're sharing very similar information, it, we need all of us sharing what we know, right? Yes. We need yes. to wake people up. We need to wake people up. It is not an easy task, but I do believe some people have come in for this particular mission. Yep. Yep. I know I have. And so, okay. What for you has been, I guess, the most um, life-changing aspect of, of understanding all of this? Because people could be like, okay, yeah, so what? So there have been ET visitors, whatever. What about my life? You know, and and what I tell people is, you know, we are not meant to necessarily be here to just wake up, we go to work, we eat dinner, and we go to sleep. Like that's, so, yeah. What has been the most life-changing thing? Um, wow. For me, uh, there's so many things. Um, it certainly keeps life interesting and life is not boring. <laughs> but it does, you know, I do think about what I will be doing after I leave here. Whereas mm. most people are not, they're not doing that, I right. think. They don't, they don't see it that way. Because I believe that, you know, see, I believe that what people consider the soul is an ET in itself. And there, it, it gets complicated. It can be different levels. So I believe that that, that that basic soul can be born on another planet, a different world, different planets. We are able to experience that. We are not just tied to earth forever. And I believe that we're immortal. So thinking ahead to that time, after what I'm going to do after I leave here, it's very interesting. But so let's say you're an ET in the world, in another world that has the technology to sort of transport you here and leave you in, let's say, stasis or something, and to Earth, and then you die and you go back to that world, or you go to a ship because you were sent down here to work. However, that science and technology works. I think about that, and I live my life in a way that okay, I'm I'm here to do this work. It fills me up. It makes me happy. And I want to continue it over there. What do I want to do? What am I here for? So my life changing, the most life changing thing for me is putting my focus in helping people to understand we're not alone in the universe, that earth is not all there is. And yes. that's you know, how I'm living my, my life. I have to say, though, often I'm living it alone. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like, you know, I feel like a person on an, a, alone on an island. Um, until I come together with people like you, Lisa, and, and we talk about it. But that's it. I, I I do. I think about the other side. I think about where I'm going. Am I getting my work done here? And then what will I do over there? I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you did. And and the fact that you, you know, you've experienced the angels, the ETs, your deceased parents, um, you know, over the last year plus, I lost my husband and my mom, so I totally- Oh, no, I'm so sorry. You know, it's, we are multidimensional beings. And so, you know, this is not just the only life we live. You know, there's that saying, you only live once. And I yeah, laugh at that. True. But, it's not uh, true. <laughs> it's not true. But I know it's hard. I know it's hard to lose people, you know, so close together. I've done, I've experienced that. But then on the other hand, we both know that they're okay. Yeah, they are. See, and that's not something that most people are walking around with. You know, I, I am sorry for it because it still hurts. I mean, we can't sit down and, you know, have lunch with them. And I liken it to, go to you know, someone going to China or something so far away from us that we'll never see again. We still feel sad, you know, but we also know we're going to see them again. Yeah. And they are also able to let us know they're there, right? Yeah. So we're probably leading a life that's, you know, better in that aspect that we're not forever sad that they're just gone. Cause they're not gone. I know mine have let yeah. me know. No. So. Yeah. Mine are, yeah. Mine are still very much there. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So what, what else either that, you know, that between the two books or just other things with words of wisdom and are just, last little bit of time here would you like for the audience to know about you your work or anything else so um 
I just would like to to say words of wisdom came from um, Edgar Mitchell. I'd like to share this with people. He was a Apollo astronaut and um, he was very spiritual and he started, I forget the name of his organization, a very, uh, Lisa, you may know it, a very uh, spiritual. I don't, I, I don't yeah, you know what I'm talking about, about right? Anyway, Edgar Mitchell basically said, uh, we're not alone in the universe and to do research about it. He says, do your research, read the books, learn. You know, basically he was saying, don't be in the dark. Yeah. Um, get out there and, and study this stuff for yourself and find your answers, people, because it's real. I mean, I know out here I live in a bubble. I'm not seeing UFOs all the time. I did see, Lisa, I have to say really quickly, I did see, see uh, three uh, beings that visited me and what we could call a dream, but I believe it was the astral, beautiful, beautiful uh, three female beings. I mean, they're, they are around us. But, um, you know, we have guides like them to uh, give us information and to guide us even to books. And I forgot where I was going with that thought. But uh, <laughs> uh, do the research, do the reading. We live in a bubble, a lot of us. We're not seeing it every day, but it's out there. And it's getting closer to you. You might know people out there that have seen something. All right? It's real. So don't live in the dark. And if we want to change the world, I think, you know, and we want to have what we call, I call a Star Trek future. We need to, we need to uh, learn, study, grow, and have conversations about what's going on out there. Yeah. Well, and I'll add to that because my newest book should be out anytime soon based on when this is being released. And really um, the information that came from my ETs, but it's, it is also very just obvious is that we need to get over our judgment of ourselves of and when we do that then we can stop judging other people we need to embrace diversity we need to really get over our fear and the polarization here on earth because we are really all connected we are all one and you know, if we're going to be part of the greater galactic community, you know, these beings, some of them look like us, but most of them don't. They have different cultures, different ways of operating. And so if we can't even accept each other, right. how are we going to accept these beings? Right. And then, you know, as far as the timing, yeah, I've heard anywhere from five to 30 years, depending on what we're doing, but we need to, humanity needs to get its act together. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we have a choice. I say in my book, we have a choice uh, between that Star Trek future, which, you know, looks pretty good to me yeah. or uh, kind of what an apocalyptic kind of uh, future. Yeah. Well, and what, so, um, what I've been given from, especially my Arcturians is that, so all of those timelines really are existing simultaneously at the quantum level. And so there are multiple earth timelines. And so really where, which, which earth do you want to live on? Do you want to be apocalyptic or do you want to be unity and love and put your focus on what, which timeline you want to be a part of? That's right. Yeah. And not have to live that day to day drudgery of waking up and going to work, coming home, going to sleep and doing it again. I would love to, to uh, live in a time where I could come into this world and focus on the science and the arts and creating, you know, technology and just learning and growing and being in harmony. And I hear that I don't, I don't know as much about the Arcturians as I do the Andromedans. I hear that their world is, that's what they focus on. You know, learning, growing, and creating. Yeah. Um, and everything is, you know, equal. There's not all of this competition. And like you said, all of this, uh, uh, I don't know, prejudice. And uh, yeah, so I agree. That's what I would like. Well, okay. So, and just one, one last question, just because you are in this world, this ufology world, like I am. Not all my guests are into the ufology or galactic stuff so there's this idea of a false flag invasion and i've had other guests on to talk about that because my understanding is it absolutely is not our ets if, if it if there's any invasion that's going to happen it is not them it is the different governments trying to keep in control so what are your thoughts on that 
Uh, well, you know, I thought uh, I thought about this a lot. Do I believe in a false flag invasion? Definitely not ETs, as you said, Lisa. I believe that there are uh, galactic hierarchies out there. I talk about them too in my book that are here for our benefit and trying to help us, protect us, uh, encourage us. Um, but d does the government really have that kind of tech where they can show mass spaceships in the sky all over the world? I think oh, they do. Huh? I think I do. I think they do. But well, okay. Um, not, and I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying I've heard people talk about it. And what I want to do is like, whether it happens or not, like if it, if something happens where it's creating mass hysteria, it, it is not our benevolent ETs. No, it's not. It's absolutely not. So. Um, so a false flag invasion, my understanding is the government's trying to create what looks like, you know, uh, holograms of ships and beings that look like we're being uh, invaded. Yeah, I don't buy that they're going to do it, that they can do it. So I don't really believe I, it. Well, I, believe, <laughs> I believe there's a lot of uh, stories and theories out there. Um, but I, you can't, I don't buy into everything. I, I'd like to... Yeah. I don't know that they can can pull that one off, but no. I so I don't believe it would be ETs, and I don't think the government has the tech. If if you see them like that, if you see Independence Day coming, <laughs> it's it's you know it's not the benevolent ETs, and they are there. By the way, there are you know stories of ETs trying to protect us. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to say that I really quickly that I think that what we see on earth as far as not accepting extraterrestrials is part of the growing pains. It's part of the process of us being introduced to the idea that we're not alone in the universe. And um, in that in that process, we are a young uh, race of beings. So the yeah. older beings, the hierarchies out there are going to be looking out for planets like ours that do not have the defense to ward off beings that have technology from millions of years ago that could easily take us over. I don't believe that is allowed. And I yeah. believe we're being protected. Yeah, me too. I fully believe that they are watching over us and protecting us mm -hmm. too. So, well, Constance, it's been really fantastic to have you on the show. Where can Thank people you. find you and, and all of your stuff? Thank you. I have a website, ConstanceVictoriaBriggs.com. Uh, you can reach me through that if you want, if you have any questions. My books are on Amazon. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm all over the place on Facebook. You can just look up Constance Victoria Briggs. I have a moon mysteries page on there that I'm putting stuff up about the moon all the time. I have an Earth's Galactic History page, um, a news and information page. So just look for me there. Uh, Instagram, uh, at Galactic Briggs, I'm on. And uh, yeah, like that, <laughs> that's it. Okay, well, um, any other books coming out that you're working on? I am working on on some books. They, uh, they're top secret right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I understand how that goes, because I had two this year simultaneously going on. I did not know which one wanted to be birthed. So. Right, right. <laughs> okay, well, I can't wait to see your future work and i really again for those watching or listening earth's galactic history and its extraterrestrial connection fantastic fantastic information in that book so thank yeah. you lisa i would like to see your books too when they're out i'll be looking for them okay, well i have already connection to the cosmos and then i have my wisdom of the galactics <laughs> so okay well i will check them out thank you <laughs> yeah and Thank you for those of you watching or listening, and I'll see you next time on Connection to the Cosmos. Aloha. Okay, perfect.